This morning on a special episode of New Day Northwest, we're celebrating Black History Month. See how black journalists in Seattle are stepping up to give voice to the community. If we weren't there, who was going to ask that question? Plus, we're breaking down barriers in Washington's health care system. If you don't trust your health care provider, you're not going to ask the questions on time. You're not going to go there until it might be too late. And as we look back through history, a hopeful look to the future. When we start talking about intersectionality, we start seeing that we're everywhere and we're beautiful. New Day Northwest starts now. It's a new this special presentation of New Day Northwest is sponsored by Primera Blue Cross. Here's Amity Adrisi and Angela Poe Russell. Welcome, welcome to the show. Welcome to this very special episode of New Day Northwest celebrating Black History Month. My friend Angela Poe Russell joins me as co-host. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, this is new. I've never done anything like this. You know, a whole hour devoted to Black History Month. And I love that not only are we highlighting people from the past, but mm -hmm. we're talking about people who are impacting our futures. So that's exciting. This is going to be a great show. So much work has gone in. It was the, you've been doing double duty on evening and with us. So I'm so grateful you're here. Oh, glad to be here. Thank you. And I'm really excited to talk about all the different things. But earlier we were talking about our heroes. Mm. sharing who our heroes are and I, I they're not always super far back they're not always hundreds of years ago mine actually is Maya Angelou oh so what do you love about her so I I remember 1993 I was 12 years old and I had seen her speaking at the presidential um, inauguration uh -huh. and then a few years later I read I know when the cage bird sings and it inspired me to be able to talk about my Ooh, experiences yes. with childhood abuse and I just I found her so brave and strong and my second is Shirley Basie because she just her voice she was born above a brothel one of nine or ten children and just grew up so strong and I think her voice just shattered boundaries and I just love her oh and I don't know much about her so I'll have to dive deeper into yes. her background thank you for sharing mine is Bessie Coleman I've always been fascinated by her she was born in the late 1800s. So think about what was available to women during yes. that time, okay? 1920, she starts applying to all these flight schools, would not let her in, you're a woman, you're black. So she heard that in France, she could. She starts learning French because the application had to be done in French. Wow. Applies, gets the, the international, and, and gets a sponsor. She goes to France, gets an international pilot's license, the first um, black woman to get an international pilot's license, and arguably, some say, the first woman from that particular place in France. Wow. In the 1920s, y'all. Okay, you know <laughs> what? Bravo, Bessie Coleman. That's amazing. She's pretty cool. She's pretty, she's pretty awesome. Yeah. That is amazing. And the impact she had. You know, and it's so often, it's it's hard to know what we do today and how it will impact the future yep. and how it will impact our family and our community. Our first story highlights what many would consider to be the best possible scenario. Yes, and it all started with a man who noticed that Seattle didn't have a newspaper serving the black community. In Seattle's ever-evolving Madrona neighborhood, you can still find a historic gem. A newspaper founded 61 years ago, still delivering the facts. I didn't realize the importance of what I'm doing. Marla Beaver was just a little girl when she started working for her dad, Fitzgerald Beaver, and his facts newspaper. It's always been positive news. I actually rubbed elbows with him in the business and really watched him operate. In 1991, when he passed away, I thought 10 years and here we are at 30 years. And beyond these walls, Fitzgerald Beaver's legacy continues to expand. Here we go. This is Converge Media's daily morning show. In Minneapolis, walked out the press conference. Converge produces digital content specifically for the Northwest's black community. The founder, Omari Salisbury, credits Beaver for planting the seeds that got him here. One of the first jobs that my dad had was a staff photographer at the Facts newspaper. But my, my father's dream was to open a photography studio. Um, and he would talk to Mr. Beaver about that. And Mr. Beaver was the one who actually, literally put my dad in business. And Omari says watching his dad's career inspired his own. After graduating from college, he traveled the world working in media. 
when I returned back to the U.S. in 2016, uh, I knew that there was a gap in our community and one of those biggest gaps being the um, delivery of content in a video format. Right, because we still had the newspaper and the radio, but we mm. didn't have this. Yeah, and, and video's tough. People have taken to the streets out there. Converge now produces 13 shows, and a centerpiece is the Black Media Matters studio in downtown Seattle. There it is, man. And in short time, he is shaking things up. The police haven't told the full story. King Five interviewed Omari after his investigative reporting led to the discovery that the Seattle Police Department used a ruse during the Black Lives Matter protest of 2020. And right after the swearing in of Seattle's new mayor, the first question came from Omari. My first question is, what you gonna do for black people? Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think uh, Omari actually knows the answer, but has given me an opportunity to display the answers that I was elected on actually, because we want to operationalize equity. That's important to be there because if we weren't there, who was going to ask that question? But what is also important to Omari is history, remembering and honoring it. The best thing about this wall is it's a constant reminder of, of where we come from here in the city of Seattle. And that's why he wanted to invite the Beaver family to the Converge studio. First of all, I really want to, to say thank you and it is such an honor and a pleasure to have you and your family here in our studios today. The amount of, of respect and honor that, like, that we have for, for the Beaver family and for the facts, it, it's almost hard to put in words. Mr. Beaver started the facts, you know, helped my dad to get in business. Here I am here at Converge. My son is studying broadcasting out at uh, Loyola University in Chicago. And Mr. Beaver's granddaughter is also following in her trailblazing family's footsteps. The UW student writes a column for the newspaper. We're all self-taught. We are all self-taught here. Um, and the beauty of that is that we've been able to sustain. The bylines may have changed over the years, but the facts remains a family business with a rich history that generations can draw from for inspiration. I tell Marla Beaver all the time, I say, man, I hope that we're doing your father's legacy justice. I hope that we're creating enough opportunity for other people. It feels good to be a part and to carry the legacy that my dad has started. And I wish he was here just to, to see that, you know? Yeah, I know he would be so proud of just everything that's unfolded since he started that newspaper. And um, the Facts and Converge are working on a nonviolence campaign together. <gasps> so they're continuing to, to mm -hmm. create this partnership. Oh, I can't wait to hear what they do next. Yeah, we'll keep you posted. Awesome. All right. Well, I, for one, am so grateful to be learning about the contributions mm -hmm. of so many black men and women. Yes, and as this very special edition of New Day continues, we talk with the Pacific Science Center about the trailblazers who made key contributions in the fields of STEM. But first, maternal outcomes in the black community. As a mother, a journalist, and a black woman, I have some key thoughts I'd like to share. We're back right after this. This portion of New Day Northwest is sponsored by Premiera Blue Cross. Hey, welcome back to this very special episode of New Day, celebrating Black History Month. And right now, we want to give our respect to the Northwest African American Museum in Seattle. Yes, also called NAM, and it has this rich tradition of preserving and highlighting the arts, culture, and history of African Americans in the Northwest. Their events and exhibitions include hosting virtual film screenings, and this month featured a discussion with the head of the Smithsonian. NAM is also dedicated to education and outreach. And in just a few days, they are actually partnering with the Seattle Sounders to bring live music, historical displays, and a giveaway to the February 27th soccer match. And you can celebrate Black History Month with NAM by going to namnw.org. You know, disparity in health care based on race and socioeconomics, you know, it's not a new concern. Strides have been made. But more is definitely needed. According to the Century Foundation, African Americans still experience illness at extremely high rates and have lower life expectancy than other racial and ethnic groups. Now, while there's no single solution, Dr. Wanda Anyoku, Chief Health Equity Officer at Swedish, says the whole community, the whole community has got to be involved. 
Um, we talk about how we, we, most of us health systems pride ourselves in delivering high quality care. And we've known for, to your point, for a long time that different groups, particularly black populations, do not experience our healthcare system or our healthcare efforts in the same way. And what the pandemic did really was to bring that into stark relief and show in technical a lot of the challenges that created the differences between the way that people experienced care. And so we will look at health outcomes. For example, the African-American population may have higher rates of maternal morbidity and mortality, you know, bad, uh, poor outcomes in childbirth than their Caucasian partners. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Latinx population might have similar, you know, somewhat in the same direction, but the, a lot of the differences are much most pronounced for the African-American um, population. And the question over the years was, well, why is that? It's mm -hmm. not a function of biology, right? It's not because, you know, biologically we're different in any particular way. And it turns out that there's a lot of factors that impact the way that we receive and experience care. A lot of those that happen well before you ever arrive at a healthcare system. So we mm -hmm. talk about social determinants of health and we talk, that means nutrition, education, transportation, all those things that affect, can you have good food? Can you get to your appointments on time? Can you take time off of work? And so if you now think about what happened in the pandemic, all of those things came together at one yeah. time. So African-Americans, if we just stick with that example, were predominantly in systems where they could not take time off work. So there are a lot of frontline workers. There were a lot of people who had to go to work. So grocery store workers, bus drivers, healthcare workers, they had to go to work. So they couldn't isolate. They also were predominantly in families that lived in multi-generational households, which you identified early was a risk for transmission of, of the virus. And so you start thinking about, you know, comorbid conditions. These the African-American populations that disproportionately have poorer control of hypertension, poorer control of diabetes. So it then became a perfect storm, right? Where all of these things combined to make it more difficult for them to, to uh, experience and receive good care. So here's a really shocking statistic. Black children are four to six times as likely to die from asthma as than white children. So asthma, a totally treatable disease, and this is just one example of this disparity. So what systems need to change to enable all Washingtonians, young and old, to have equitable access to care? We need to build a bridge to the community. We need to connect to these groups that we understand as we now understand that we are not serving, you know, we're not getting the best outcomes in those groups. We've known that. But what are some of the reasons why? So if you think about asthma, for instance, in children, mm -hmm. children are subject to who's going to bring them to their appointment. Yeah. If mom and dad are both working three, three jobs, can't take time off work, can't get to their appointment on time, then they don't get their prescription filled, right? If they're living in crowded conditions or they're living in multi-generational spaces and they can't find a, you know, they, the air quality is challenging, they're subject to the adults in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. And if the adults in their lives don't have the resources to do the things that those children need, it's, it's challenging. If also the families or the community don't trust the healthcare system, haven't experienced it as being mm -hmm. you know, compassionate and fair to them, well, then they're not likely to go, they might push off going to receive healthcare until it's too late. And so you want to bridge those gaps. You want to get who is trusted in the community? How can we build partnerships either through the black church or through trusted community organizations who can bridge those gaps, who can give education to the families, give them resources? Do they have access to health insurance? Children should, but if the uh, parents don't, or they might not recognize that their children should have that access. So who gives that information and helps them sign up? So in trying to close these gaps in equities, it's important that we understand who we're serving and what their barriers are. And then we start to take apart those barriers piece by piece. People said that healthcare moves at the speed of trust. If you mm. don't trust your healthcare provider, you're not going to ask the questions on time. You're not going to go there until it might be too late. So building that trust and building that connectivity is what is really critical to serve the black population and make sure that they get the outcomes that we intend as a healthcare system for us. And you can learn more about health equity and the work Dr. Inyoku is doing by going to the website you see right there on your screen. Mm -hmm. You know, I was really struck by her saying that healthcare moves at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, it is so important 
that we trust. And in order to do that, we have to improve these outcomes. And she mm -hmm. briefly mentioned maternal outcomes. And I know that's something you have spent a lot of time looking into. Um, yes, and it was because of my own personal experience and those of many others that I felt we should use this platform to talk about this. We have a problem, and it's one all women should be concerned about. Do you know we are the only developed country with a rising maternal mortality rate? These numbers on the screen represent the deaths per 100,000 live births. Here in the U.S., we lose more mothers each year than all of these countries. And the CDC says 60% of these were preventable. And for black women, the situation is much worse. Black women of all ages are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women. And in 2005, the realities hit close to home. I was about to have my first child. There I am, eight months pregnant. Aww. I ate well, no pre-existing conditions. I was just really healthy. Well, I had a C-section, and I remember telling the nurses that something felt wrong at my incision site. They dismissed it, and finally, when someone did listen a few days later, they discovered a major problem that was too late to be surgically repaired. And there's more. My legs started swelling, my blood pressure started rising. I had always had enviable low blood pressure. My mom, my rest of my family started begging them to do something. Nurses kept telling them, this is normal, it's fine. We knew it wasn't. Eventually, they sent me home from the hospital, and within a day, my blood pressure rose so high that I had to be rushed to the hospital. It was in stroke territory. This time, a doctor put me in a pediatric ward, and I'll never forget his words as he left the room. He said, maybe here you will get better care. I realized later that I wasn't alone. Serena Williams came out and shared her story of being dismissed. And before Serena, there is Kira Jones. This is Kira holding her newborn. 12 hours later, she was gone. Her husband had been begging hospital staff to do the CT scan doctors had ordered, but was told she wasn't a priority. Serena Williams spoke out about her experience giving birth and invested $3 million in a startup that plans to use technology to close some of these gaps. And there's a lot happening at the federal level to make a difference. You know, history has taught us we know how to get things done in this country. When hospital infections were skyrocketing in the early 2000s, the medical community rallied and implemented standardized prevention practices. Infection rates dropped drastically. It's one bit of history, the lesson from that history, that I hope we can repeat for the sake of the mothers birthing our future. Well, from inventors to astronauts to pioneers in public health, coming up, we are celebrating the black scientists who have made key contributions to society and who continue to make groundbreaking discoveries. We'll be right back. Welcome back. During our Black History Month celebration, we salute Lonnie Bunch, the nation's first African-American secretary of the Smithsonian. Bunch has dedicated his career to preservation. In 2005, with zero funding, no collections, and only one staff member, he developed and built the Smithsonian's National Museum of African-American History and Culture. Standing prominently next to the Washington Monument, the museum is dedicated to the documentation, education, and exploration of the African-American story and its impact on the history of our nation and the world. From engineering the Egyptian pyramids to inventing automatic elevator doors, black people have made countless contributions in the fields of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. The Pacific Science Center works to amplify black voices, not just in February, but all year long. And today they are shining a spotlight on six STEM heroes from a list put together by kids in our community. This project actually started several years ago with some of the teens in our youth development program who put together a showcase of some really awesome black STEM professionals. And then over the years, we've just kept kind of contributing to this, sharing more and more black innovators from past and present. So really excited to share some of those people with you today. Love it. Okay, and kicking us off, Lonnie Johnson. So tell us about Lonnie. So Johnson is an engineer and inventor. He has a work history in the Air Force as well as with NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. 
And one of my favorite stories about him is that he said as a child, he was experimenting with making rocket fuel in his home, nearly accidentally caused a fire in his house. But you know, his parents, instead of getting him in trouble, they were actually really supportive. They told him, hey, get a hot plate and do your experimenting outdoors. So I think it just shows, you know, the curiosity that people have when they're young and how that can lead into a career later on. He went on to invent the Super Soaker, which is really cool, now in the National Toy Hall of Fame. He has over 100 patents of things that he has invented over the years. When I get my next Super Soaker, it'll be in honor of him. So there you go. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so the next one's Mae Jemison, Stephanie Wilson, both with NASA. Absolutely. A lot of folks might be familiar with Mae Jemison. She was the first black woman in space in a mission in 1992. But did you know, not only is she an astronaut, she also has her doctorate in medicine. She has spent time in the Peace Corps working with refugees. And she even had a cameo on the show Star Trek, making her one of the only people to both be an astronaut and also play an astronaut on TV. So I just think that is super cool. And, you know, she has been a Star Trek fan for a really long time. She said that she was inspired by Black actress Michelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek. Trek. So pretty cool. <laughs> Love that. Um, okay. What about Stephanie Wilson? Sure. Yeah. So this is another black astronaut. She's one of 18 astronauts on the Artemis team. Artemis is a NASA mission sending some folks to the moon coming up really soon this spring. The launch date is scheduled for late March. So Wilson might just be the first woman to walk on the moon. So I definitely encourage folks uh, to stay tuned with that project to maybe, you know, follow along with Wilson on her next journey into orbit there. Wow, I am geeking out on this because so many of the people that you're, well, a few of the people you're mentioning on this list are people like we can follow right now, which is really cool. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. so Ray Wynn Grant, a wildlife ecologist. So Ray Wynn Grant, I really look up to her. She is a conservation scientist, like you mentioned, working with large carnivores. So what she does is actually study conflicts between these human communities that live close by to the territories of where these large carnivores like bears and lions might live. And she's working to help educate those communities to help them you know, coexist peacefully with these animals. And one of the things I love about her story is that she said that she has always really loved bears since she was a a small child, but that she never got a chance to actually work outdoors or see these animals in the wild until her early 20s. And so now she is a really big advocate for these, you know, equitable, accessible experiences for youth getting into the outdoors at an earlier age. And I just love that about her. Yes. And I'm also noticing that a common theme in these stories, the curiosity starts young and, and really having those opportunities for it to be nurtured. So I think that's something to point out. And now you're going to talk about a professional race car driver. Yes, busy as a Roja, engineer, entrepreneur, very successful race car driver. He has a really interesting story as well. He was born in the United States and he actually went to university back in Nigeria starting at the age of 16. Pretty incredible. He was studying chemical engineering. He came back to the US. He worked in pharmaceutical research for several years before he decided to kind of go back to his passion for cars. He started a company called Busy Moto Engineering, where he designs these really high performance engines for cars. And some fun facts about him are that one of his vehicles was actually featured in some of the Fast and Furious movies, if we've got any fans out there. And he said he once engineered a 1,000 horsepower minivan in seven weeks just because he says he loves a good challenge. <laughs> I am in awe, and I love that you just have these fun facts. And one more I want to get to, Marie Maynard Daly, a biochemist. Absolutely. So again, folks might be familiar with her name. She was the first black woman with a PhD in chemistry here in the United States. And she's done some really important research. She's helped us to better understand the causes of heart attacks. She researched the relationship between high cholesterol and those clogged arteries that causes those heart attacks. And she was also one of the first researchers involved with investigating the effects of cigarette smoke on lung health. Wow. And you have an experiment that actually helps kind of highlight her one of her accomplishments. For Dr. Daly that we just talked about, we actually have a model lung that you can make uh, just using some really simple materials that you have lying around at home. 
and we have a video that shows the whole experiment. It's on the New Day Facebook page, and there's a different experiment for each of the black scientists featured by the Pacific Science Center. If you'd like a link to that and to all of the other content in the show, we made it super easy. Text the word history to 206-448-4545. All right, well, coming up, we explore black mental health and wellness. What are the biggest barriers and how can we remove them? We're back right after this. Hey, welcome back to the show. You know, facing racism, discrimination, mm -hmm. inequity has significant impacts on a person's mental health. Totally, um, but only one in three black adults who report needing mental health care actually receive it. I discussed this complex issue with author, speaker, and mental health advocate, Richard Taylor Jr. It feels like there are just so many barriers when it comes to seeking treatment for mental health concerns. What are some of the barriers that black people in particular face? We could talk about like socioeconomic disparities, right? And how a lot of the historical disparities, whether it's slavery, segregation, you know, those play a part in it. And I think that those are very, very important. But if we're taking it from an internal aspect, the first things I think about are the taboo space. If we talk about a subject um, or show any kind of, you know, um, emotion around what we're going through, we're labeled as being weak or, you know, that's not something you talk about, right? So that what happens in this house stays in this house clause that we would hear, you know, for, for a long time, depending on how people grew up, even from like a religious background, it's kind of like, oh, your faith should be enough. This should be strong enough. These are some of the, the more common things that I think that we have seen. And then even, I think on the external side too, you know, there is this disconnect when it comes to the idea of the lack of, you know, black mental health professionals in the field. And so that not being able to link individuals in that space, Oh, it's huge. I think about just so many people, me included. I mean, trying to find someone is really difficult and find, trying to find someone of, of color um, who has yeah. availability. Yeah. And then so many mental health care providers, you know, don't take insurance anymore. So that's a barrier. All of those combined, essentially what they do is they put us in this position to where we feel hopeless, right? And so we kind of just throw our hands up and we say, you know what, I'll just, I'll, I'll keep sweeping it under the rug. I'll deal with it myself and whatever happens, happens. Yeah. So the stigma piece that you were talking about, I know you've been working on how do you break the stigma? What are some things we can do? We need to be able to do the same thing that we would do with our physical health, which is make investments into it. Right. And it's a thing of not waiting for things to happen. Right. So my idea is this. Let's be proactive rather than reactive. Right. And so with our mental health, if we're taking the time ahead of time, one, to identify the fact that we have a mental health, it's not a bad thing. It's a part of our being and it's actually a great part of our being. But then I think from there, after identifying, we can then move into a space of saying, what are some things that I can do to invest into it? This is how we start to break the stigma, because now what we've done is we've created a level playing ground in this idea that since we all have a mental health, maybe I need to take a step back, right? Because maybe I'm the individual who's a little toxic when it comes to not carrying a level of empathy for others who struggle, but also not realizing, i.e. COVID, all it takes is one situation. All it takes is one circumstance. And I can find myself definitely, if I'm vulnerable and susceptible in a position to struggle with anxiety for the first time or find myself dealing with depression or dealing with grief with the loss of family or friends. So I think what it does is that it puts us on this level playing ground to say, I'm no better than the next person. But then also for those people who have been quiet, who've had to live in silence, they're now in a position too to be like, wow, we're all the same. I love that. I love this. Beautiful. I'm going to remember that. I have a body. I have a brain. I'm going to take care of both. There you go. I love it. I'm, Here you I'm go. hoping before you go, you can clear up one thing because we've been hearing a lot about this in recent years about generational trauma and what does yeah. racial trauma look like? How do you explain How do you explain the impact of racial trauma on black Americans? We talked earlier about historical disparities, right? But then if we looked at a lot of the historical happenings that have taken place, whether we're in the civil rights era or whether we go through slavery or segregation, and then when we see some of the things that we see in our society now, whether it, you know, no matter what it is, I think it almost feels sometimes like it's a cycle repeating, right? 
it doesn't just hit us from a cycle standpoint. It's the after cycle standpoint that I'm really concerned about. It's the, the hopelessness that we discuss, feeling like some things will never change, right? It's the anxiety of what is going to happen when I walk out the house today? Am I going to have an experience with somebody? These different circumstances can start to cycle in our brain. And I think this is one of the major effects that we see is that how it starts to change our mood, how we start to change ourselves, our identity to fit in, to feel like we, we need to be accepted by, you know, everybody, whatever the case might be. And in this, it can start to kind of put us in this position to where I think sometimes we aren't living in our true identity and true self. And, and because of that racial trauma, we find ourselves in this loophole that seems like almost impossible to get out of. What you said felt so true for me. And the thing about racial trauma is it's the kind of trauma that isn't just one incident. Sometimes it's the cumulative of a bunch of incidents and it can take a toll on our mental health. Mm. It is so important to note, there's help. We put two good resources here on the screen. You can also find these links on the New Day website. Such important conversation. So glad that you had that one mm -hmm. specifically. Yeah. Well, coming up next, we are checking in with two groups who are helping to celebrate the black and queer communities through the arts. More on that when we come back. This portion of New Day Northwest is sponsored by Primera Blue Cross. Hey, welcome back. You know, throughout the show, we've been highlighting black figures and organizations that inspire. One of the most celebrated in Western Washington is Langston Seattle, a nonprofit based around the Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute. The Langston vision is to cultivate black brilliance, including funding and supporting to local artists. Take a scroll through their Facebook page and see their dedication to art, education, outreach, even health care in the black community. To learn more about the programs and events, go to langstonseattle.org. Now, one of the things Langston is committed to is creating a safe space for the queer black community. They recently partnered with $3 Bill Cinema to feature films that tell the stories of the queer black community. I think intersectionality is probably one of my favorite topics. We really recognize how vast the black community is when we start talking about intersectionality. We start seeing that we're everywhere and we're beautiful and we're luscious and we're queer and we have homelessness and we have varying abilities and we have people in corporate, we have people in nonprofit, we have people across the board and intersectionality allows us to see just how beautiful that makes us all, but also how important it is to recognize that without all of these parts, we cannot create change. We cannot come together. It allows for many of us to create community in a variety of spaces, but also hold and honor our differences at the same exact time. Intersectionality, especially within queerness, really starts to highlight our differences that then overlap, right? We are all this yeah. entire web of humans across this beautiful space, yeah. The queer community is very diverse. When it comes to the Black queer community, what should people think about? That there's not just one answer for mm -hmm. any of us, that there's a lot to learn. Not any one person's going to be able to tell you exactly what it is like to be Black and to be queer, which really opens up the opportunity for us to build out and talk about what it means to celebrate who we are and also talk about where we're able to invest additional resources, invest additional conversations, and really be able to elaborate on where are we able to be? Where are we able to really take power and dance and create art and create films and bring in more people and celebrate our foods and mix up how we're able to work in spaces and how we're able to really maintain this trajectory of queerness and transness in our communities. I think that that's a really good point that you make. And Isabella, my question to you is about the arts. It Y'all did a film event recently to spotlight all of this, all of these topics. Any films that you'd recommend for all of us to watch and learn from? 
Yeah, of course. I mean, there's the classics, you know, there's Paris is Burning. If you haven't seen Paris is Burning, what are you doing? What is wrong <laughs> with you? It's one of the greatest films that has ever been made. It's it's a documentary. It's available, I think, everywhere. Also, if you haven't caught Moonlight, it's one of the most amazing films. Also, what are you doing if you haven't caught Moonlight? Where have you been? Amazing performances, amazing cinematography. Some of the other movies that have come out recently that I love are Rafiki. There's a movie called Pariah. There's a movie called Tangerine, which was all shot on an iPhone, which is really crazy. It's this movie that is about Black trans women trying to survive, and it's taken from such an empathetic standpoint, which I love. Strong Island, which is a documentary about a Black lesbian woman. It's on Netflix. Bessie, the story of Bessie Smith, one of the greatest queer blues icons of our time. Uh, and also, I Am Not Your Negro, a great, fantastic documentary, also so available everywhere. And um, one of the films that we taught, we screened, uh, which is Watermelon Woman, which is another Black queer classic film. So if you haven't seen any of those films, where have you been? What are you doing? Get into it. <laughs> Watch all those movies. Th that is required viewing. All right. And if everyone out there didn't get to write all those down, we're going to have them on our website. Don't yes. you worry about a thing. But Isabella, what are your hopes for the Black queer community in the future, going forward. Yeah, I think it's very similar to what Alana was talking about. Um, the things that I hope is for not only just our health and our safety, which has always kind of been secondary in culture, in government, in society. I'm talking about our mental health, our sexual health. I'm talking about our physical health. I'm talking about all the different kinds of health that we need in, tour in order to not just survive, but also to thrive as people. The safety that we need to feel in order to to be able to express ourselves, have the jobs that we want to live in, the, live the lives that we want to, without fear of being uh, being legislated out of our lives. The fear that you have to have, where every single life as a black queer person, can I go to this space? Can I go to this bar? Can I go to this bathroom? Every single section of your life is lived in such fear, and I wish for us to be free of fear. I I wish for us to be able to live yeah. authentically, beautiful, big, open, wide lives because so much of our culture is based on queerness. Your fashion, your music, your dance moves, your lingo, your TikTok, all of that comes <laughs> from Black queer culture. And we want the same kind of love that you give to our culture, to our vibraciousness, to, to our vibrancy, to, uh, to drag queens, to to our fat, all that stuff. We want that same love that you give to what we give you. We want that back. Yeah. And that's where Alana was talking about with investments. Mm -hmm. We want to be invested in um, and not just taken from. And so that's really what I hope for, for the Black queer community. Investing, yeah. All right, well, one of our favorite contributors, Terry Holloman, is about to join us for a very personal conversation. Up next, what he's learned from his parents who were once sharecroppers in the segregated South. We'll be right back. Earlier in the show, Amity and I talked about some figures from black history who inspired each of us. We also posed this question to our New Day contributor, Terry Hallman, and here's our conversation. Um, my family, my parents, are really my black history heroes of this month and for really every month. I look at my, uh, my dad in particular, growing up in rural Arkansas um, on a sharecropping farm his entire life until he left high school to college. He was a sharecropper. My family basically owned nothing, not a house, not a car. They worked in a cotton field. My dad, my father worked in a cotton field until he graduated from high school. And they worked on that field in exchange for living in the house that they lived in, which was a, a basically a wooden shack, a wooden shotgun house with aluminum siding. And I grew I grew up sometime in my youth there, so I don't know what it was like out there. And, you know, to go from that to going to be the first African-American football player at Arkansas State University on scholarship, he used his athleticism to get his way out of a situation where, you know, it was, you know, poverty and destitute. And, and sharecropping, basically, a situation where it's just basically one step above slavery, if we were really being honest about it. And he took his opportunity to go to college, ended up going to Canada to play.
played professional football for 10 years and is now a successful businessman. And I just think it's an amazing story, um, you know, that I get to witness up close and personal. So Terry, what were the opportunities like in your town, you know, for black people? Yeah. So in the, the, the rural area of Arkansas, where my, my family came from, there weren't very many for African-Americans, you know, farming was basically the, the biggest thing or, or, or working in the fields were the biggest thing. There wasn't really an opportunity if you wanted to be a teacher to go teach at the main high school because it was still kind of segregated. You know, mm -hmm. you could be a, a teacher at the black segregated school, but you couldn't go be a teacher. You couldn't be the principal. You couldn't go be a physician because or you could be the black physician. You could be the physician for the people who were working in those rural jobs. But opportunities were very limited. And so these were the opportunities that they had and they had to make the most of them. And sharecropping was it. And it wasn't really the best opportunity for you to get ahead in life. Yeah. And have you always been this open, Terry, about your family and the history? You know, I actually have been. You know, you think about some of the things that my family has gone through in the past. Um, you know, some of it may seem traumatic and some people may be ashamed and want to hide it. But honestly, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of it because my, my family was able to find a way out of no way, you know, in a situation yeah. where most people didn't make it out of out of where they were. And, you know, and that includes my mom. My mom was in a situation, too, where, you know, I look at think about my I think about my mother, who is really one today, one of the most glamorous people you would ever want to meet and think about her as a young person working in a cotton field. You know, and I remember stories from my grandmother talking about my dad. And back in the day, I used to think it was funny when they'd say, oh, your dad would just pick just enough cotton to fill a bag to lay down on. And they were doing that to make fun of him. And I was like, I'd laugh back in the day. But now I think about it. Think about a young man, a young child in a field picking cotton and it's 100 degrees outside just enough that he could lay down in the middle of a field on. So I'm proud that I came from that. And I'm in a situation now where I can do things that they could never have dreamed of back in the day. Hmm. Do you um, ever find, Terry, that there is kind of a lack of understanding of how recent all of this was? Yeah, a lot of people like to think of these things as taking place in the ancient history, the ancient past. But if we really break it down, the Civil Rights Movement Act was signed in 1964. That's just a little, like a little bit over 50 years ago, almost 60 years ago. That's all of our parents' lifetime. Yeah. And so these are people that are still around us that were alive when segregation was legal, when it was not allowed for black people and white people to intermingle. So it wasn't that long ago. And like I said, personally, my parents come from sharecroppers and, and, and you know, I got to experience what they lived just by hearing their stories, their influence on me and, and impacted the way I am today. Yeah, I remember my mom telling me about when the, her community, they were finally forced to hire black people. And then when she got there, they were like, we've hired enough black people and, you know, no more. And then they were someone in the community advocated. She got her job. You know, my dad was the first black police officer in town. So, yeah, this is recent. We it is it is it is history. And it's and we are the present is a reflection of kind of where we come from. Well, think about this, Angela. I mean. You, you said, you know, your dad was hired and they were like, no more. And that's what we like to think about. They say, oh, we had the civil rights movement in the 60s and, and you know, then everything was equal and fine. No, it was not. Mm -hmm. Think about if the, the entire country was a certain way for hundreds of years and then they signed this, this bill into law. People didn't change. People didn't change immediately or not even to this day. There's some people still hanging on to some of their old beliefs and thought processes. So I think if, you know, for us to celebrate and acknowledge it, the Black History Month and the accomplishments that Black people have made in this country, it helps to change things for the future generation. Mm. Mm. So well said. I love that conversation. I do. I really enjoyed it. And I really thought about, I mean, the, the thing that struck me was not that far in the past and, and the change that still needs to happen. And it's mm -hmm. hard and it's difficult to talk about. Yeah. And it makes people very uncomfortable sometimes. But things have not changed quickly enough. And I feel like it's still a long way to go. Yeah. Well, um, I'm glad we had the conversation. We're not, you know, we've never arrived when it comes to this issue. And right. I think that's the number one thing. As Terry said, it wasn't that long ago, but look how far we've come, yeah. so. That's why we're having this show. Yeah. I love this. So coming up next, uh, we're gonna share some final thoughts as well as more broken barriers in the sporting world specifically. Yes, hint, hint, it has to do with the Kraken. We'll be right back. 
Hey, welcome back to our Black History Month celebration on New Day Northwest. Yes, we could not end the show without celebrating a local trailblazer in sports broadcasting. Everett Fitzhugh is the nation's first black announcer for the National Hockey League, the voice of our very own Seattle Kraken. On February 17th, Fitzhugh and former NHL player JT Brown made history in the first ever all black broadcast for the NHL. So today we celebrate Everett for breaking barriers in broadcasting and we wish him the best in his newest venture, Parenthood. What? Yes, he what? just announced that he and his wife are having a baby. Congratulations, Fitz. This is exciting news. The littlest Kraken fan I is coming I love that. To town. You know, as, look, as we wrap up this hour, we just wanted to take a quick moment to reflect on all the things we talked about today. What, what stood out for you? Um, the you one that hit me the most was talking to talking about the queer black community mm. and how when she said you know you love and celebrate all the, the vibrance and the vivaciousness give that love back and that got me and then when you spoke about mental health and access to mental health that is, seems just so important for the health of our community as a whole. Absolutely. Yeah, I think for me, well, I love all of it, right? <laughs> it's such a good show. But um, the Pacific Science Center, and I picked that one because representation for our kids, it matters. Yes. And being able to identify people living right now who are making history in the moment yeah. that our kids can look to, all kids can look to, and say, wow, I can do that too. I think that's really powerful. It is. It's so true. And I got to say, Bessie Coleman, I love that story. Yes. I think that's going to be an inspiring one. The next one I'm reading my daughter. There you go. I love well, it. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you for being mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Remember, if you'd like a link to anything we talked about today, we made it super easy. Text the word history to 206-448-4545. And thank you so much for spending time with us today. Remember to go out and enjoy your new day. We'll see you next time. Some segments of New Day Northwest are paid for by these fine sponsors.